I started off, um, there is a misconception, which is a lot of people assume that the Ottomans were a Khilafah from their inception, from the beginning, which is not true. Um, they become a Khilafah in, uh, you would say, in 1516, 1516, 1517. So the earlier part of Ottoman history, um, what we're trying to do is explain what they were. And the word in Turkish is Beylik, which is the common word used in Ottoman studies. It basically means principality. So it's an area... And the reason why it's called Principality is because I don't know if you guys um, watch Attack on Titans because I was watching the last episode and one of the interesting things is the person asked, what's a nation? And the people were confused when they used the word nation because they didn't know what it meant. And the idea of a nation is a very modern term. So prior to the 19th century, we wouldn't have used the word nation. So to explain the early Ottomans, we don't say they were a nation. We say they were a principality, which is an a loosely governed area um, which ha had particular state administration but they become an imperial power which means they almost become a, um, a, a power in the sense of when we're saying that they're an imperial power that they almost become what you could say a monarchist power in which um, there are particular traditions now of accession particular traditions of um, of of how um, it, what it means to be a leader, particular clothing, a particular decorum of interaction. So prior to that, as I mentioned before, um, the Ottomans were a state, but they, they, were, they were a state which was um, growing as an entity. But now they become an absolute imperial power. So what we see then is, um, you can change the slide. Um, uh, okay, so um, this area is interesting. We spoke about Mehmed Chelebi last week. I mean, sorry. Did we? No. Where did we stop last week? Um, we stopped at Mehmet Chalabi. Okay, Chalabi. so we're not going to talk about him without enough time, but we'll talk about Murat and um, we'll talk about um, Fatih. And between then, father and son, um, they basically ruled for over 60 years. That's a, a, um, a phenomenal amount of time uh, to have a sort of like... Um, two people in power for that long and the the advantages of ruling over that long period of time is that um you can you you can have a policy and you can see that policy through so i give an example of today um today um when we um have uh people in power um because they're only in power for four years or eight years max um sometimes when the new government comes into power, it um, undoes or uh, undoes, sorry, um, the policies of the previous person, right? So currently, you are seeing in the United States of America. If those of you are following, probably not following American politics, but I'll tell you anyway, um, is that the Biden administration is undoing some of the policies of the Trump administration, right? So um, um, the father and son is Murat, and the, the son is Mehmed Fateh. Um, so what we start to see is that, um, but when you're in power for a long time, you can see your policies through, you can implement your policies, you can see them through, you have enough time to build your state. And so in the case of uh, Murat and Fateh, there's an opportunity to build their state. In Murat's case, because he has seen the interregnum, so you remember last week we were talking about how kids were fighting each other and brothers were fighting each other in particular, that created a, a, a feeling of chaos. And you have to understand how people must have felt like these brothers are fighting each other. So what Murat wanted to do is he wanted to consolidate the domains, right? That doesn't mean he doesn't go on jihad. He does go on jihad. But his main idea is to consolidate, right? Um, whereas Fatih's opinion is to expand. So we have these two opinions between father and son, which is different. The reason why Murat wants to consolidate is because I, I give you an example. Sometimes when you have a situation of chaos, you just need somebody to come in and just to make everyone feel relaxed. You say, all right, take it easy, people. We're just going to hold it together. We don't need to do anything else and so forth because sometimes you don't have the resources for it, right? Um, so this is what Murat is doing. And the problem that Murat had um, is that there was a freeway power struggle in the Balkans. So now we see the power, the struggle between the Ottomans, the Hungarians, and the Venetians, right? 
the Ottomans, the Hungarians, and the Venetians, there's a power struggle, and Albania, the area of Albania becomes a proxy where all of these free peoples or these free powers or entities are competing over one another. What Morat is trying to do is he's trying to unify his domains um, to try to create some sort of like um, semblance of, of unity. Yeah, that's right. And so as a result, when Murat is now um, unified the domains again, you remember when I spoke to you about Timur Lane? Well, the son of Timur Lane, Shahrukh, yes, his name was Shahrukh Khan. Um, so it's interesting, you know, not the Bollywood actor, just to, to remind you, he came before the Bollywood actor and was actually more famous than the Bollywood actor, it's just that we don't remember him. And Shahrukh Khan so basically insisted to Murad that, listen, my father, Timur Lane, had made an agreement with after the defeat of Bayezid with the Ottomans, that you are going to maintain the integrity of Anatolia, which is the, Turkey and the Balkans, and you're going to leave it the way they are. But Murad, you are extended after Ch Mehmed Chalabi, you are extending your board. What are you doing? Do you remember the Mongol tradition? And uh, Murad, who knew that Shah Rukh was weaker than his father and was occupied by the things that are happening in the east, just ignored him. You know what? I, I really don't care what you think. In 1439, which is not on this slide, but I'll explain to you. In 1439, we get the reproachment, which is um, the Latin Church and the Orthodox Church. They come together, right? And this is important. This number 1439. Let's put this down for you. 1439. All right, because the Ottomans are now aware that the two Christian churches in the Balkans and in Europe want to come together to probably try to um, make an assault on the Ottomans because there is a concern now that the Muslims have a presence in Europe, right? And so this is on the Ottomans' mind. So if you can see in the beginning, Murat is in power for uh, 23 years and then he abdicates, meaning he steps down, right? He says, and then Fatih, his son, is in power for two years and then Fatih is removed from power. And we'll explain that. So then Murad comes back to power for another five years and then dies. And then Fatih then comes back to power because of the death of his father and then is in power for 30 years. So Murad um, was the first person to abdicate. And it's very interesting because usually um, Ottoman sultans would not abdicate. And um, in that sense, um, his abdication was based on the fact that he just was tired of um, being in power for, for that long, okay? So um, 1439 is when the two Christian powers, the Orthodox and the Catholic Church, got together, okay? And, and tried to create a form of unity, that they would support each other from the Ottoman threat. So um, what you see in Murad's case is that he, there's a sense of exhaustion, and he was hoping that his son Fatih would take over. But Fatih was only, um, from what I remember, uh, 14 years old. Um, when he um, 14 or 15 years old when he first came to power so imagine how young he was right and so there was a sense of feeling that Fatih was too young and uh, as I told you before uh, uh, Chandarla Halil Pasha who was the Grand Vizier of Murat he was then the Grand Vizier of Fatih and he was concerned that Fatih wanted to conquer Istanbul or Constantinople so Chandarla Murat, um, yeah, the, so the Prime Minister virtually, the Grand Vizier would have been like the Prime Minister, but they call him Sadr Azam, and um, he was concerned that Fatih had ambitions of conquering Constantinople, and he was concerned because he felt that rather than conquering Constantinople, we should have diplomatic relations with Constantinople, because if we go to war with the Byzantines, we're going to create agitation with the Christians who have just unified, right? So his fear was the unification of the Christians. Um, and he felt that an attack on Constantinople would create a vicious attack by the Christians in Europe. So he was reluctant to, um, to uh, e e extend uh, the, the borders of the Ottoman domains. But when Murad dies in 1451, and Fatih, at the age of 18, 19, becomes Sultan again. Fatih um, is now encouraged to conquer Constantinople. And Fatih is supported by uh, three men in particular. One is a Shihab ad-Din, 
the other one is Zagonos, and then the third one is Turukhan. And these three men in particular were, were Ghazi warriors from the Balkans who felt that this was the best opportunity for um, um, Mehmed II, so Sultan Mehmed, to conquer uh, the Byzantine capital. So you can see that there is an internal power struggle taking place between two different ideologies, between a, a older ideology which wants to consolidate power, which doesn't want to agitate the current situation. They have seen when Bayezid was, um, when Bayezid Yildirim, the, the thunderbolt, was quickly conquering lands, the problems it created, they were aware that um, they didn't want to go to war with another superpower, um, so they wanted to take it easy. But Mehmed II, who was a younger generation person, his colleagues were younger, and they felt that, you know, we should go to war, we can achieve this, they had, they had zeal, they had energy, they had motivation, um, they really wanted to press ahead and move towards um, uh, youth is insanity. Yes, okay, that's a different way of saying it. Um, you know, they, they say that, um, uh, what's it? Um, youth is wasted on the young, you know? Uh, it's a strange idea that um, the, that uh, when you look, when you're young, you look good, you're strong, you're fit, you're healthy. But when you start to appreciate those things, you're old and you no longer can use them. Um, so yeah, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and so, okay, the Battle of Varna is, is interesting because the Ottomans um, under um, Murat um, defeat the Poles to some degree. But what's even more interesting in this time is in 1444 is the... Uh, is also... Um, yes, um, Murat is in the middle, just in case any of you forget. No, no, um, because the, the caption has Mehmet, but I say he's got oh, mistaken. Okay. Yeah. It? And, and it, this is Skenderbeg's rebellion, okay, in 1444, 43-44 in Albania, Skenderbeg, who was a Christian who became Muslim, rebelled against the Ottoman authorities because he wanted uh, freedom for his townsfolk and independence from the Ottoman center once he came to his, back home. And the reason why Skenderbeg is important, because if any of you get to go to Kosovo or Albania, He's now presented as the new hero of the Albanian nation in opposition to the Ottoman Muslim past. It's very fascinating the how Skenderbeg's rebellion has, is considered as um, something to be celebrated. And that's because in Albania, Albania, I think, is the first Muslim country which is um, with the religion of the state is atheism. Okay, most Muslim countries, if not all Muslim countries, are secular countries, but the religion of the state is considered Islam, uh, so they couldn't escape from that past. But the Albanians were the first who, um, who made, the, made the case that they were an atheist state. They wanted to make that case clear, and that's because they had communism. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that comes later. And so they made Skenderbeg the hero, who was a, a person who rebelled against the Ottomans in 1444. So 1444 is an interesting time, both in terms of the Battle of Varna, where the Ottomans defeat the Hungarians, consolidate their authority in the Balkans, and, and, and start advancing into Poland. Yes, Muslims went to Poland. And at the same time, it's also seen as the rebellion against, um, against the Ottomans by Skenderbeg Pasha, who was an Albanian. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So the Crusades, this is once again linked to the point I made before. And so here is the concern the Ottomans had, which is 1439. The two churches are going to come together as a way of attempting um, a assault on the Ottomans. Um, whereas um, Chandrala Halil Pasha believed that um, this threat is only a rhetorical device to, um, to put fear in the hearts of the Ottomans. And the um, Christians will only execute this threat if the Muslims try to conquer Istanbul, Fatih's group believed that this threat was for real and that they need to be preemptive. They need to, you know, nip this in the bud and, and make the first move. Okay, so this is what happens here. So you know, I just wanted to ask about, you know, oh, yeah. with the abdication of Sultan Fatih, yeah. wasn't, no, uh, no uh, yeah, sorry, when the, with the abdication of Sultan Murad, wasn't a crusade called straight off the back of that? to take advantage of it, and that's yeah, why Fatih called him back. There's a famous letter or something? 
Yeah, so there is a, a an idea that when Murad abdicates, that the I mean, one of the interesting things that I, I remember reading in the Sirah is just that Rasul Sallam uh, used to pay attention to what all the other states were doing and what the, all the other peoples were doing at the time, so that when he sent messengers uh, to to give the call for Islam, that they knew exactly what to say. So they were paying attention, and and this is something that that's necessary in the Muslim to always pay attention to what's happening in the region that they live in. And it's intriguing because the, the non-Muslims are doing exactly the same. They're paying attention to what's happening in regards to the Ottomans in the leadership. So when an Ottoman Sultan is murdered, killed, lost, dies in battle, whatnot. These are the moments when there is political turbulence and weakness. And it is true that when um, uh, Murat um, steps down and abdicates, the, the Christian powers in particular see this as an opportunity. Why? One, because Murat has consolidated domains, done it efficiently well. Um, and two, because Mehmed II is young and they're thinking this is a, a fantastic opportunity. Um, it's not necessarily that that Mehmed um, wants his father not to abdicate. I think it's the the elites at the time are, are, are concerned that the abdication of Murat will create some level of chaos that would provide a, a footing for, for the... Um, for the European powers. And the problem now is this, once Murad abdicates and he makes the symbol of doing that, the, the deed is done. Now, you know, uh, and then Fatih, uh, Mehmed II, who comes to power for two years, it's too late now. Now you've created a sense of chaos in the domains. You've created an opportunity for the uh, non-Muslims of, of the possibility that the Ottomans are weak. And so now you can see why there is this belief um, that you know what um, we need to push on now and just push on for Constantinople so this is what happens in that context yeah so yes um, he becomes Fatih so what happens is um, this is an interesting you know people you know there is a, a, a painting similar to this and I don't know if it's Akbar or Oranzeb um, in in uh, even in, in the Mughal period, there is a painting of one of the Mughal leaders smelling a, a rose. Um, was the abdication a personal decision or advice council? I don't think the advice council were given, would ever have given the advice to abdicate, to step down. I think for them, in those days, it would have been, um, it would have been something of a, a political suicide for someone to abdicate. I, it seems like um, what has happened is to be in a position of political authority is um, was exhausting for Murad. Um, and I, I and I personally think that he felt he had a strong state. He felt that he had good advisors. He felt that the advisors were good enough to 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 take the state forward. And so he wanted to step down. But that's why sometimes it's important to even have your symbolic role in power. You might. This is why you know like. Sometimes people ask the questions, why should Muslims be in power? Why should Muslims have power? This person was a puppet and so forth. These all might be true, but when you symbolically still have power, that still creates a precedent. It's still important. So the idea that the Sultan abdicates is an indication of weakness. And even if the Sultan is not running his affairs, even if this, let's just say, for example, I'll, I'll give you an argument. Um, when Chelsea had Avram Grant as their manager, he was not doing anything. When I, I remember reading about this, he used to just turn up to training, and the players knew what to do. They would do. They knew what to do. They had been drilled by Mourinho. They had. Uh, they they uh, had the culture of of what it meant to be successful. The new manager comes in, and he's just basically doing nothing. He's just a token manager. Having said that, it's still important to have somebody in authority and power, so that there is still a a mechanism to look up to someone. If that person doesn't exist, it creates chaos. It leads to chaos. And so the advisory board and the elites would have... Oh, that's my neighbor. She's uh, not happy because I'm speaking too loud. Okay. Well, the advisory board and would have been... Um, they would have been... Um, show me off my change. He always does that. The advisory board would have been upset at the fact that... Um, that f somebody would have not been in power. And so this is what we have. We have the idea of stepping out of power as being problematic. So they didn't want uh, someone not to be in power. And so um, I don't think they would have encouraged uh, Murad to step down. Okay. 
Now, once he steps down, we have a total different situation. All right, let's go. Okay, so this is now the map again. I wanted you to see this map of, um, so you can see the, um, the Byzantine Empire, and it's a couple of islands off the Ottoman coast, and then you can see the, the main, uh, uh, Asim, can you show them the, where um, Constantinople is? Yeah, okay, great. So as you can see, the Ottomans have totally surrounded Constantinople. And um, if you can show them the cross, so the purple part is the European side, and next to it, the yellow part is the Asian side. These are still both part. These are still both parts of today's Istanbul. Okay, but what's interesting is Fatih's troops. They had made it all the way um, to the Asian side, and they could see the European side from the other side of the river, and um, the Byzantines could see them also. So imagine how close they had got, you know, like um, in, in today's day and age. So the, the Byzantines were aware of the Ottoman presence. So I don't know if any of you have been to Istanbul, but, you know, there's a bridge that separates the two continents, they say. So the Ottomans were actually on the Asian side of the continent and the Byzantines could see them on the European side. That's how close they were. Bayezid had built a castle called, and it's called Anadolu Hisada um, on the Asian side and what uh, Mehmed did the second is he then built a castle on the other side and the idea was to create a castle to suffocate the supply chain it's called Romeli Hisara to food supply coming into Constantinople so if there's no food coming you can see totally that the Ottomans have now totally suffocated the Byzantines the Byzantines are in trouble there's nowhere for them to go in that sense and uh, um, on April the 20th um, um, so no prior to that um, Mehmed II has 160,000 men, 160,000 men um, to um, to go to war against the Byzantines. This is like the largest army in, in that period of time that the Ottomans had ever gathered for a conquest. So wouldn't the Sultan have a will to make it easier to find the next ruler? So usually in, in the Ottoman period and in Islamic history, the ruler doesn't write a will. For someone to be in power next there's a bayah that's given some they are chosen by the people in charge in that sense um so you don't leave a, a will behind and this has been problematic in early islamic history that if you say that he's going to be in power next this has created a lot of problems for us there have been exceptions um but um so you know i give an example a, a lot of people sometimes get confused so when you look at muawiyah's reign when he was in power and then he wanted yazid to be in power and to some degree, yes, he wanted his son to be in power, but at the same time, um, he was concerned that Damascus was, would lose his authority, and he didn't want authority to be given in the hands of Ibn Zubair or um, Hussein to some degree. And so sometimes it's happened in Islamic history where um, um, a, a ruler has, 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 has created conditions for the next person to already be in power. And we see this as a case in the Marwanids as well, in Marwan, in the Umayyad period, who not only says that that um, I'm going to be protected, but he makes a case that the next two in line will be in power as a way of protecting his lineage. So these things have happened in Islamic history. They have happened in Ottoman history too. But in Fatih's case, um, the idea of leaving the will was problematic. Usually what they did is they created an environment of the survival of the fittest. The strongest person to come to, to, to the capital city is the one who deserves to be in power because he's the strongest. And if he's the strongest, it means the strongest person has the authority to um, to uh, rule the, the domains. Okay, so this is what happens. You can go to the next slide. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, this is the one. So this is uh, um, Istanbul here, as you can see, Constantinople. And um, first of all, I want to make this clear to you that Istanbul and Constantinople are both Greek words. Okay. Istanbul comes from the word Istanpolis, which means the city, and Constantinople means the same, like Constantine, the city of Constantine, right? And the Ottomans used the word Constantinople um, even until the end. Okay, now uh, Reis has asked a fantastic question, which is, if they were completely surrounded, why did they not just surrender? And this is the argument that Fatih makes, that you were completely surrounded 
why did you not just surrender? The possibility of that is uh, that on many occasions, different entities and different peoples have tried to conquer Constantinople and they have failed. And it's because the city was, um, the walls, it was garrisoned in exceptionally well. That's the first thing. And the second thing is in this moment in history, the Byzantines were under the impression and the belief that um, the, Chris, the Christians would come to save them. That was the hope. Uh, that the Christians would come to save them. And, uh, and on April the 20th, Fatih's naval fleet was totally smashed. Because to, to get your ships in, because, so uh, I can't show you here, unfortunately. But... Um, Do you want to show the chain? Yeah, the boom chain. It's here, it's here, it's, here, it's, here. it's in your picture. I don't know. Can you oh, show it? Yeah, it's here. Can you see where my yeah. uh, mouse is? The chain, it actually says chain. If you really concentrate, there's a chain at the Bosphorus. Right. So the problem was was that for the the Ottomans, they can't come right with their boats on the front, and they need to get to where it says Golden Horn, because that's the weakest part of the wall, right? Um, and they couldn't get their ships past that chain. It's called a boom chain, which means that every time a ship came, people pull the chain, and because the the ships were made from wood, it would destroy the the ships, and the ships would sink. And most of on April the twentieth, most of um, uh, Mehmed II's naval fleet were just being smashed and so Chandrala Halil Pasha was feeling vindicated at the idea that as he said look I told you it was a mistake to try to conquer Constantinople what are you doing we're losing resources this is humiliating it's a mistake and now the, the, the Christians are going to come as a way of exacting revenge this we should not have done this at this moment of time and by the 26th of May there were rumors that started to spread amongst the Ottoman troops that the Christian armies are coming. They're on their way to support Constantinople. And Mehmed II felt very conflicted because even his soldiers um, at the time, they, they, they were split amongst themselves of what to do. And this is something really important to understand in, just in history and in Islam and in life, that rumors always create fitna and facade. Okay? It's one of the ways of creating disunity is when people start talking nonsense about each other. Always make sure that we always have clarity in terms of the information that we hear. Otherwise, is, and this has happened on many occasions on the battlefields where Muslims have gone to war and rumors have created disunity amongst the soldiers and created chaos. So Fatih was feeling slightly demoralized and he didn't know what to do in regards to that context. And um, as a last ditch, um, the next day, Akshams ad Din, as we mentioned, his, his sheikh, comes to him and says that he had a dream. And in the dream, what he says is that the Ottomans will be successful and they will conquer Constantinople. Right? The key was to take these boats. So can you see where it says number four? So that's where the boom chain was, right? Uh, and so the idea was, was to send some boats around the front and then get some boats and take them over that section of four. It's, if, if any of you have been to Istanbul, it's the area of Kabatash, Besiktas, and they pulled it over um, into an area called Kasım Pasha. Now the interesting thing is, is that the Byzantines never expected this to happen. Nobody expected this to happen. When a young Fatih, Mehmed II, sorry, shall I say, at the time, when he told his soldiers, that we're going to take a couple of ships. There weren't many ships, it was about two or three. We're going to take them over. We're going to cut down wood, roll them, grease them, and keep... So what, what you, they would do is they would get a plank of wood, put it like this, then like this, then like this, then like this, then like this. And so imagine, let me see if I can find something like this. And so you would, you would roll them up the hill, right? And you take another plank of wood, put it here, and then roll it up. And so that's how they took it up the hill. And they, they only needed two or three because they had cannons. So once they made it to the back, they got their cannons and they just blasted the walls. And, and that's how they infiltrated the back. And they were the first to penetrate the walls of the top cupper, um, come into Constantinople, and um, they took the city. And that was a phenomenal feat. The men had died trying to do that as well. It must be remembered. So um, this was... Uh, 
And you know what? In all honesty, to uh, to believe someone to do that. Imagine if someone told you, you know, you're playing football and say, listen, this is what we're going to do. And they, they give you a tactic which is absolutely crazy, you know, and you're saying, what are you talking about? This is crazy. This is never going to work. But they believed him. And they actually believed him and so forth. Yes, yeah, so um, the actual hadith of, of being conquered. Now, there's different opinion amongst different people of whether the hadith is talking about Fatih. He becomes Fatih after this, whether you're talking about him or not. But the Ottomans definitely believed it. And this is in, when you go to Hagia Sophia, they put the hadith uh, on the wall as a reminder to everybody. Um, my belief is, is that um, I don't think we should be critiquing uh, um, Fatih in the past um, from today's lendings in any shape or form. I mean, what he achieved is phenomenal. Can we just read the hadith maybe? Yeah. The Prophet ﷺ قال النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام لا تفتحن القسطنطينية فلنعم الأمير أميرها ولنعم الجيش ذلك الجيش. The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "Indeed, Constantinople, Constantinople will be conquered. How great, how wonderful, how blessed a leader is its leader, and how blessed an army will that army be." Yeah. كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام. And, and either way, you know, like I said, this is a phenomenal thing for them to achieve. And, um, you know, they achieved it. And for the first time, the Muslims have taken over an empire, you know, and this, this was a, a unique experience. And uh, Fatih now becomes, so Mehmed II now becomes Fatih, and um, he um, is vindicated. Okay, so there's many people who, who have throughout Islamic history attempted to conquer Constantinople and failed. In fact, you know, I'll tell you some interesting stories. Um, Fatih tried to conquer Rome as well, um, but he died on the year that his ships landed on mainland, what you say today is Italy. In fact, Fatih was also lucky, you know, like um, Fatih, um, Fatih was nearly killed by Count Dracula. You guys know Count Dracula? The story of Count Dracula is actually of a count, Romanian count, in Wallachia, who, um, who um, the reason why he had this name, Vlad the Impaler, his name was, um, and uh, he tried to assassinate Fatih in his tent in the middle of the night, and killed people, but it was in the wrong tent, and Fatih survives, and the person who kills Vlad the Impaler is none other than his own brother, who converted to Islam, and was an advisor to Fatih. So, um, Ustad, before we move on, can we just make mention of, um, I think it's in the time of Yazid, mm -hmm. or it's an army led by Yazid maybe, that um, uh, when the Sahaba tried to conquer Constantinople, so there's a famous, and Ustad will probably um, elaborate on this, but um, the, the great Sahabi of the Prophet وسلم, Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, mm -hmm. who the host of the Prophet وسلم, when he comes to Medina, yeah. they say he was ill as they approached the city, yeah. and as the, as the siege was failing, he said, take me as far as you can within the city and wherever I pass away then then bury me as deep as you can within the city yeah. so I mean there's a rediscovery of his grave will start that happens right yeah. so would yeah. you mind so, sharing um, I, I think it's not Yazid's time I think it's in a time of Muawiyah okay my bad um, um, and so actually there's two interesting things here um, so one is um, in the, the, the they call her um, um, I forget her name and, um, um Haram bint Milhan in Cyprus. Haram, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, so the expedition initially goes to Cyprus. And on the way to Cyprus, Rasulullah had told her that she is going to die a death of a martyr without spilling blood. And she didn't understand how this was going to happen. And she went with the expedition that went to Cyprus. She fell off her, um, her, her camel, snapped her neck and died. And um, the Ottomans had found that tomb, and they had built a wonderful, like, uh, sort of like area, um, a mosque and an area around it. It's beautiful. I've been to it. It's on the Greek side of Cyprus, not on the Turkish side of Cyprus, on the Greek side. Um, so there, during th these um, 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 moments, there had been many um, attempts by the earlier Muslims to. Um, to conquer Constantinople and Muawiyah wanted to be one of those men of the prophecy, uh, obviously. And uh, Ayub al Ansari uh, was clear, he also was part of an expedition. He was very old, I think he was in his late 80s or 90s. 
uh, when he went, but still chose to go. And he's not the only uh, Sahaba who's who's buried in, in in Constantinople. Actually, when you come here, um, the Turks, if, if you know certain um, religious ulama and so forth, they can give you maps of, of, of places to go see the, the various Sahaba who are buried in the city um, during the expedition, the failed expedition. But Ayyub al-Ansari was one that passed away. And um, even the Byzantines were nervous about his tomb being in Constantinople because they felt that the Muslims would always come back um, as a result of it. And his tomb was found, um, as I, we mentioned two weeks ago, um, in Constantinople where they, um, by um, Aksham Sintin, who had a dream again. And um, they say that when they opened the tomb, that they had found certain, um, what you could call memorabilia or items, which was an indication that it was Ayub um, in that sense. Um, but on that stretch in Ayub, in the area of Ayub, there's a lot of Sahaba that are buried there. And it's not only Sahaba are buried there, uh, in the area of Ayub, when you go there, it's, um, there's a lot of key personnel in Ottoman and Turkish history who are buried there. Uh, so that became a famous area to be buried at, in that, in that sense. Um, so it's a really important place to go. And what's interesting is in the Ottoman period, once they become a Khilafah, um, the Khalifa would first go to the Salat al-Fajr and pray Salat al-Fajr at Ayub, and then make his way to Hagia Sophia, and, and then be inaugurated as the Khalifa. And during the Hajj procession, when the Hajj began in Istanbul, or the or, or the Balkans, they would the Hajj would start from Ayub, the the Masjid of Ayub, and then they, they would go to Aqsa, and then they would go to Medina, and then they would go to Makkah, and that would be the Ottoman Hajj. The Ottoman Hajj was done in that manner. Um, is, is there an understanding? I mean, I remember Ahmed Tariq sort of mentioning that Ayub Sultan, mm -hmm. he's he's sort of known to be the heart of the city. And um, they call is it, is it, do they call Ayub Sultan for a specific reason? The idea that yeah, so they, they call him yeah Sultan Ayub or Ayub Sultan Ayub. In some ways, was when uh, when Fatih conquers Istanbul and the need to well, so it's, there's a difference of opinion. But some people felt that Fatih was then trying to reconstruct Istanbul in the image of Islam. He was trying to make Istanbul just like Damascus, just like Cairo, just like Baghdad. He wanted to to socially engineer the city and the city. Um, needed um, um, no, the city needed an Islamic image hence the building of the monumental mosques but not only that the I, the idea that it already had something from the Islamic past that dates back to Rasul that in of itself was important because it, it shows that the significance of this city in that context and so then when Ayub al-Ansari was this tomb was discovered um, they they shaped the imagination of the Muslim city around that, attaching it back to Rasul Salam, and that was necessary for them. So this is why they, and this is important then because a lot of people make the case that the early Ottomans or the Turks were Turks, and they're obsessed with Turkishness. But here you see something different. Here you're seeing that they 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 genuinely had an attachment to Islam, and they wanted to attach it back to the foundations of Islam, which was Rasul Salam. So there is something here that I think we need to take into account, which I think some Western academics are not taking into account. So obviously this is the Hagia Sophia, and as you guys know, this became very controversial this year. Um, now, you can see that the four minarets are different, and that's because two minarets had fallen over during an earthquake, so they built, added another two minarets on there. Um, and um, one of the interesting things, um, so I, I have, I can't, maybe I could show you here, let me see. You won't be able to see it fully, but um, let me see if I can find the pictures. Um, While the stars looking for that, I'll just make mention that we did a session when the Hagia Sophia was reopened. We did a live stream session with... Can you see that? No, I don't know what that's meant to be. Is that... Okay, so this is Hagia Sophia at night. Oh, subhanAllah. And the day that they opened Hagia Sophia, I went to pray Salat al-Isha um, at the mosque. Um, and uh, I have never seen, um, I don't talk about this openly because there's a lot of people who want to like hunt me down and so forth. Um, but um, I went to Salat al-Isha at the mosque and um, it's, it was a phenomenal experience for me. Um, we turned up for Salat al-Isha and um, I've never seen so many Muslims before in a mosque in Istanbul like this. And they opened the doors, we walked in, 
and the Muslims were just in tandem or yelling Ya Allah, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, which is a modern thing that they do in Turkey. There is no this order. I don't know where it's come from, but they they started saying it. But it was intriguing hearing this in the corridors of Hagia Sophia, like everyone was saying it together. And Hagia Sophia has a interesting like acoustics to it. We entered the mosque and uh, we all found a space and uh, we sat down. And you got to understand, it was really interesting. So we all sat down on the floor and, um, you know, we were looking at each other. And um, I think COVID was still happening. So I, from my, what I remember, we all had our masks on, we were all told to distance where we were sitting on the floor. And then the Imam came in and um, he's, the, the Muslim kicked off and then uh, the Salawat was done. And then when the Imam recited Fatiha, um, everybody was crying. I've never seen that before in my life. Uh, yeah, on the Hajj, I, had, I saw it, but this was different. Like, grown men everywhere from, from different denominations of, of from Salafis to people who are part of Tariqats, to people from India, to people from London, from Turks, just grown men crying during the Fatiha. And it was a very unique experience for me to experience that. Um, and when the Salah finished, the, the Imam, he gave a little talk. He said, look, I want you to leave quickly because of the COVID situation. You can't stick around. But I also want you to say this, that you have just prayed the first Salat, or Salat al-Isha, of the reopening of the Masjid. And the euphoria in the space was intriguing. And it's because, um, for those who don't understand, Hagia Sophia is a part of Turkish Muslimness and Turkish Muslim identity. Okay, um, for many Muslims in Turkey, they felt that their identity was taken away from them when the mosque was closed down and that there was an imposition placed upon them by the secular establishment in regards to stripping the mosque away from its mosque status and making it a museum. This has, you know, a lot of Christians don't understand this because what they're obsessed with is a history of 600 years when Fatih conquered Istanbul. But for many Turks in the modern period and for many Muslims who didn't understand this, this is like taking something, you know, ripping an infinity stone away from you, right? In that context, you just like if your vision and you pull the infinity stone out, it's over. And literally, Hagia Sophia was the infinity stone of the Muslim identity in Turkey. And to lose that was humongous. And so for them in that context, to get it back was a hu huge thing. And to be here at that time, um, alhamdulillah, I am really grateful for that because at the time, it felt like I was praying in Aqsa, a very similar feeling, because it's a medieval building, um, a very classical building. And I'll tell you an interesting story. I know I'm going off point and I apologize about that. Um, so um, three weeks before, um, I had gone to, I had said to my friend that I want to, they've opened up Hagia Sophia, the museum, because it was closed during COVID. And I said, I want to go visit. And my, my friend Emrullah and I, we went together alone. And we went at 10 in the morning and we were the only people in the building. And I'd never seen this before. I'd never been in Hagia Sophia where there was not a single person there. And so me and him were walking around, you know, this, that, the other. And so I, I look at the, the security guard and he's at the mihrab and there's a, you know, you can't, go, you can't go in that section. And there are people washing the mihrab. So I look at him, I say, hey, can I ask you a question? He goes, yes, Hojam. I said, what's going on here? He goes, they're washing the mihrab. I said, why? Why are they washing the mihrab? He goes, I, I don't know. I said, Is they, are they going to turn this into a mosque? And he just looked at me and smiled. And I looked at him and smiled. And we sort of understood. And then, you know, this it's unthinkable to do this in Hagia Sophia at the time. And I just did sujud and got up. And he just let me do it. And um, we walked out. And um, my friend Emrullah and I, we, we, we started getting the, the strange sensation that they're actually going to try to turn this into a mosque. And what was interesting is I mentioned this to a friend of mine who's a journalist the same day that I think they're going to turn it into a mosque. This is what's going on. This is what I've seen. My friend had a meeting in the morning at his work and he works for TRT. And he said to them that, you know, they, they might turn this into a mosque and nobody believed them. They said, no way, this is never going to happen. So you got to understand, even as close up to when they turned it into a mosque, Nobody really thought that this was going to take place. They never accepted or believed that this was going to happen. This is how um, closely the, the decision was. So it could have gone either way. And what a lot of people don't realize here also is the reaction from secular Turks in, in Turkey wasn't as aggressive as the reaction by Muslims in the West. Even secular Turks in Turkey sort of accepted it. They said, yeah, fine, look, whatever, man. This is a mosque now. You know, it is what it is. Who cares? Let's move on. 
um, because this was part of Turkish Muslim identity, whereas Muslims in the West got very triggered to a building that they don't even come and see. So, well, start, um, I mean, you spoke about Turkish Muslim identity. I don't yeah. want to take off topic, but this was this was like the center stone. I mean, uh, just a little backdrop maybe that yeah. it used to be the hair is the centerpiece of yeah. the Byzantine Church. When yeah. Fatih conquered it, he tran yeah. you know part of his vision of transforming uh, into Islamic city, he converted yeah. it into a masjid. Yeah. We we did a whole session on this. If people yeah. are interested, you can go. I put it on the the classroom Google um, folder as well. You guys can check it out on the Hagia Sophia and the whole history, but. Wasn't it like it was very important not just to the Turkish Muslims, but there's also this narrative of everybody. The yeah. Isafir was our masjid. It was like the fourth of the Haramain. After the Haramain and the Masjid yeah. al the yeah, fourth yeah. masjid of the Muslims was totally. the Isafir in, in Istanbul, right? Totally. So when, when Fatih conquers Istanbul, and uh, the question was asked by, um, who was it asked by uh, uh, before, um, that why did they not uh, surrender, right? And what's interesting is because the, the Byzantines didn't surrender, when Fatih conquered Istanbul, it was absolute conquest, which means now the, the whole city is belongs to him. If they had surrendered, there could have been terms of surrender. That's what you do. When you surrender, you make terms of surrender, which is we're going to surrender, but we want A, B, C, D. And this is the case of Umar bin Khattab. Yeah, okay. And when Umar bin Khattab um, um, yani, um, opened uh, uh, Jerusalem, Quds, Right. Um, what you see is that the Christian patriarch made the case that, OK, we will surrender. That's what they did. They surrendered. And they sur the, con the conditions were we will surrender if the caliph of the Muslims comes to meet me himself. And we will then surrender. And, and the terms of surrender was what? That we will not um, um, take the Holy Sepulchre as a church. And this is the conditions that Omar bin Khattab accepted, because what did Omar bin Khattab want? He wanted Aqsa. He had no interest in the sepulchre. The sepulchre was insignificant to the Muslims. What was significant was Aqsa and to, to, to create the, the, the area of Aqsa and the idea of building Mashal Aqsa in that context and the issue of power. But in Fatih's case, it's absolute conquest. And when Fatih conquers Istanbul, you have a building which was not only a church, it was like the White House. It was a, it was a seat of power. Whenever the Byzantine emperor um, passed judgment, he executed judgment from the mosque. I mean, the church, sorry. He ex it was the place where law was made. It was the place where law was implemented. It was the place where law was given. This was an institution of power. And with the Byzantines no longer there, this was an empty building. It didn't function just like, you know, a, 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 a mosque in Tooting where somebody goes to pray. This was a, a monumental structure of power that lost its capacity of power. And Fatih had to do something with that building. And so he decided to turn it into a mosque. And, and, and as a result, it would have been unfathomable for um, a Christian monumental building of power to humiliate or to look down upon Muslims at the time when the Muslims had conquered Constantinople. That would have been unthinkable. So as a result, it becomes a mosque. Not only does it become the mosque, it becomes by the time of Suleiman the Magnificent, Abusud Effendi passes a fatwa to make the case that this will be the monumental mosque of the Ottoman domains, the monumental mosque, okay? And so as a result of that, um, during the time of the Tanzimat and Abdul Hamid II, which is the late 19th century, this was the mosque where the Khalifa was given bayah. And this is now ingrained in the, the Ottoman Muslim psyche. And when I was young, and um, you know, I'm quite old now, we used to have prayer mats where we used to pray Salah on, which were, which were made in Saudi Arabia. They were made in Saudi Arabia in the 1980s. And on one side, you had a, 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 like stitched into the, the prayer mat was Makkah, and on the other side was Ayah Sophia. We had these prayer mats. So it was even then, it was in the global Muslim consciousness that Ayah Sophia was part of the Muslim identity. Ayah Sophia was the fourth holiest mosque in the, in the Muslim world. It was Makkah, Medina, Aqsa, and then Ayah Sophia. That was how it was. And the, the, the current Muslim imagination has forgotten that because they became so accustomed to it being a museum. But this was monumental. So here what you see is the, the Imam who's, who's given the Jum'a Khutbah, he has the sword in his hand. And a lot of people then try to, you know, say a lot of things. But this is the culture of Islam. Because the, the, the city was a conquest, um, he has a sword in his hand to indicate the conquest. And you know what's interesting? When I was in Damascus, 
um, I used to study in Damascus. I remember going to a Jummah khutbah in Masjid al-Umawi where Sheikh Ramadan Bhuti was giving a Jummah khutbah and he had the sword half open. And I couldn't understand why he had a sword. I was new to this. Uh, firstly, why does he have a sword? And why is the sword half open? And then I spoke to an alim who was a friend of mine there and he says it's because Damascus was half conquest, half surrender. And as a result of that, Sheikh Ramadan Bhutti then had the sword half open, it's half conquest, half surrender. So this is part of the tradition of Islam. This is nothing to do with humiliating anyone. This is just uh, in terms of uh, the, the, our tradition and the way we practice it. And so the Turks, once again, executed that tradition because it's important. I, I, I know I'm going off topic, but I want to explain something to you, okay? Um, the word insan, come, it comes from the word to forget, okay? Insan forgets. It's very different in the Arabic medium than it is from the English medium. In English, when we say you're human, it means you're somebody who's worldly. But in Arabic, when you say you're insan, it means you're a person who forgets. So the person who forgets requires continual dhikr. They need remind, constant reminders to remember. This is why we do ibadat five times a day. This is why we do afqar. This is why we, we constantly read Qur'an, because we forget. And so Allah Ta'ala has placed mechanisms in place to remind people so that they don't forget their traditions and, 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 and deen and so forth. So as Muslims, we have to continuously remember Allah, continuously remember the practices of Islam, and continuously remember our history. And then in this case, the Turks brought this memory back to remind people, because we are people who have forgotten. And this was very clear, because when the Turks did this, a lot of Muslims didn't know what that was. They had forgotten. And so this is important to bring these traditions back, to remind us that this is part of the deen, and this is part of our tradition, okay? Um, yeah, so these were the, the, the Sheikh al-Islams during the autumn, Ottoman period in that sense, and their contributions, and it's important that you understand that the Ottoman devlet, the Ottoman state, is not simply a military state, but it's a state of, of, of in which the, the idea of the Sheikh al-Islam is, is, is very important. Um, I'm not going to, I've taken so much of your time, we don't have much, so we're going to have to kick on from these guys, unfortunately. Um, but is there something you want to add? Yeah, okay, basic in general. Okay, so I was just thinking. I was just thinking because um, it might be nice just to let the guys, just if they have any questions, yeah, go for it, just to let them yeah, yeah. process everything. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions at this point before we move on, inshallah, to Monasana? was that Ibn Kamal Pasha and no, so, um, so, you're gonna go back? With, you know, uh, sorry, yeah. So this is I, I this is Mullah Fenari on the right. Yeah. He is the first ever Sheikh al Islam, I think, in the time of Fatih. Yeah. And this is Ibn Kamal Basha. He becomes Sheikh al Islam in the time of Salim, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know what's yeah. interesting is that um we had members in the early Ottoman period, we had members of the ulama who had who did become Grand Viziers. And uh, so the Sheikh al Islam in the Ottoman period is basically the highest state mufti. So the person who put, and, and he's basically the advisor to the to the sultan to, and he's basically the highest um, alim not necessarily in knowledge okay but in terms of job responsibility so it's important that there are many ulama in the muslim world at the time and only allah knows in terms of who's more knowledgeable and who isn't but what is important to understand is that the the state itself required a state mufti um in in, in that sense um to advise the Sultan to execute fatawa in the, in the capacity of the activities of the devlet. So, for example, let's just say the Sultan wants to go on jihad. It comes down to the state mufti, the Sheikh al-Islam, to decide whether it, it's something that Islam permits or doesn't it permit. In this sense, because many of the rulers in the Ottoman period were not ulama themselves and maybe didn't know all the rules of Islam, it was important for them to have an, uh, an official alim um, around them. Now they had many ulama, so people may ask the question, you know, um, why only have one and not have many? They had many ulama, but just like in any job, the buck has to stop with somebody. There has to be one person who is, you know, in charge by and large, okay? And so in any organization, you'll see that, you know, even like I give an example, I support Liverpool, and we have many leaders in the team, like Van Dyke, like Mohamed Salah, like Robertson, but there's one captain on the pitch. There always has to be one captain on the pitch, and that's important in that sense. And so the Sheikh al Islam was that captain for the ulama who spoke and interacted with the Sultan, Jordan Henderson. Hendo. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, um, I, just very quickly, Rais has a question. So, so because when you spoke about the state mufti, just very quickly, mm. um, the state mufti is not like how we think of the state mufti today, like your local imam at the masjid, no. or some guy who gives a fatwa nobody listens to. No, the Sheikh al-Islam right. was a very powerful role, right? That's right. That's right. He was an exceptionally powerful person. And um, he, his position was, when he when he gave a fatwa, it was the state given a fatwa. Okay? And it, it was his fatwa. If you wanted to remove a sultan from power, it was his fatwa you had to take. You couldn't take any other alim's fatwa. It had to be his fatwa. And it had to be, you know, um, in that sense. Um, so, and the Sheikh al-Islam, so there was a hierarchy. Um, and the hierarchy was, that um, you had a sheikh list, you had a muf the grand mufti of Anatolia and the grand mufti of the Balkans, so the Kaza Askar, and then basically the um, and then you had multiple other um, chief judges, chief qadis, qadis, and muftis. And usually, um, the Ottoman Sultan will choose a mufti either from Anatolia or from the Balk or the, the Rumeli, so they had usually a a choice of those two. So if they made it to the top, he would usually choose one or the other. The, near, in the early period of Ottoman history, um, the, um, the Sheikh al-Islams, they were mainly Turkic, or some of them like even came from Arab provinces because people came from different backgrounds. But later on, a lot of the ulama would come from the Balkans. Um, so, yeah. Okay, basic in general. All right, let's do this. Uh, okay. So after Fatih dies, he has two children left behind. One is Bayezid and one is Jem. And you know, the question was asked before that why didn't the sultans uh, leave behind a will? And like I said to you before, it, it wasn't necessarily down to the, simply the sultan to choose who should be in power or not. The best thing to do was, it was like a survival of the fittest situation. And so after Fatih dies, and I want to explain something to you, which is going to sound really crazy, but when Fatih was in power for 30 years, Near the end, Fatih's centralization policies, because Fatih had centralized Anatolia, the Balkans, and Constantinople, Istanbul now. Uh, while he was seen as a hero for conquering Istanbul, after 30 years, there was a sense of frustration by people who felt marginalized. They, Fatih had been in power for 30 years, and they were just like how, I keep mentioning it, <laughs> Attack on Titans. But there's an interesting scene in Attack on Titans where one of the characters, she used to be a revolutionary, but now that she's in power, she's become the status quo. So what this means is when Fatih was young, he was like, the, you know, youth, wants to change things and so forth. But after 30 years, Fatih became the status quo. And there was a new group of people that wanted to do something different. And so people who wanted a different state, they turned to Bayezid. And they wanted Bayezid to, to, to um, because Fatih had... Uh, centered a lot of his authority from the people of Rumeli, the Balkans. A lot of people in Anatolia who felt that they had been marginalized by Fatih. Because you remember that it was the people of the Balkans who had encouraged Fatih to conquer Istanbul, right? And so um, the people of, um, of Anatolia felt a little bit um, disconnected from the new power configuration. Because Fatih had conquered Istanbul and he wanted the people of Istanbul to be accepted, he put a lot of emphasis on the Byzantine sort of aspect of Ottoman history, Ottoman culture. So he basically made sure that he kept the, the Christians happy. He didn't marginalize them. He made sure that the people who were soldiers from the Janissary courts from Romilly would be the ones that he would uh, support. He would try to build Istanbul. And at times by building Istanbul, it was to the detriment of other parts of the Ottoman domains. So many people from Anatolia went to Bayezid and, when, uh, and they were supporting Bayezid. And so there was a standoff between Bayezid and Jem. Jem was young and he, went, he was under the... And Fatih wanted Jem to be in power. And so um, Jem was going to continue the policies of Fatih. And Bayezid wanted to con um, um, make a shift in the policies. Bayezid was trained in Farsi. Bayezid was trained in uh, Islamic philosophy. And Bayezid was um, um, a, a practitioner of Sufism. And so whereas Fatih was being trained in European languages to understand how to make his empire work, um, in that sense, you can see that Bayezid was different in that sense. And so Bayezid was stationed in... Um, uh, she, she, she. Uh, Amasya, and Jem was stationed in Konya. 
and Amasya is about 680 kilometers and Konya is like 700 kilometers and so once they found out that Fatih had died there was a race between Bayezid and Jem to make it to the center and so this is how the Ottomans did it and unfortunately for Jem um, there were many people on the way who supported Bayezid who were making it difficult for him to make it to Istanbul in time so <laughs> Whereas um, they tried to tell Bayezid late about Fatih dying to give Jem a head start, in some ways the supporters of Jem were becoming obstacles in the way, um, sorry, the supporters of Bayezid were becoming obstacles in the way of Jem. Bayezid made it to Istanbul and became Sultan. Jem made it to Bursa. And so then Jem sends Bayezid a letter and says, Listen, I don't want to fight you. We are both children of Fatih. Why don't you rule from Istanbul, Romeli? And from Bursa, I will rule Anatolia. Why don't we just split it 50-50? We're brothers, we don't need to go, you know, go down this route. And Bayezid refused. He said, no, I'm not going to let you do that. Okay, We're not going to do it like this. So you can see that there is already an agitation in that sense. So Jem is defeated and forced to, um, to, to go south and as a way of trying to survive. Jem goes to Aqsa and then Jem goes on Hajj and then Jem goes to Cairo and uh, under the auspices of the Mamluks he speaks to the Khalifa and he says to the Khalifa about in terms of what's happened to him and so forth and this idea is important because while the Khalifa and the Mamluks had no interest in supporting Jem by taking an army to, um, to attack the Ottomans what it put in the minds of the Ottomans, and this is important because Selim will, it will stay in Selim's mind later, is that the, the Khalifa of Cairo had the capacity as a Khalifa to delegitimize Istanbul. And that concerned them. That, you know, the Byzantines can no longer deal, we are, we are, we are power, we, we, you know, and so forth. But somehow um, the Khalifa in, Ista in, in Cairo can still delegitimize us. And this is a problem. And so this stuck with them in their mindset, in their psyche. Jem then travels to Europe in the attempt to try to get help from certain Christian powers to defeat Bayezid. It doesn't work out. He doesn't succeed in doing that. Eventually, um, Jem writes a letter to Bayezid and just goes, listen, man, I, I just want to come back, you know, retire as a Muslim. Um, and it's interesting because he was taken hostage by the Pope and the Pope said to him that if you become Christian I will support you in your war against your brother Bayezid and Jem just goes no way um, I'm not going to leave Islam I'm going to maintain myself as a Muslim and he's asking Bayezid to allow me to come into the domains and just live my life quietly away Now, the reason why Bayezid couldn't allow Jem to come into the domains and just live his life quietly is because Jem could still rally the troops against him and that fear was always going to be there and you've got to understand how these politics are okay so in that sense in the end um jem dies and um bayezid pays money this is interesting on the one hand bayezid's armies and people are not going to allow jem to live peacefully in the ottoman domains because he could start an army but on the other hand they don't want him to be a tool that can be used as a, a puppet by the Western powers either. So he wants him to come back. When he dies, he pays the money. Uh, he, he, he frees certain Christian soldiers from prison and he buries Jem in Bursa. And uh, Jem is buried in Bursa and Bayezid is then in power. Okay, uh, we we'll go to the next one. Okay. Uh, so um, one of the interesting things uh, during Bayezid's time is in 1492. 1492. Granada is uh, conquered by the Christians. Granada falls in 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 uh, Andalusia, and this is intriguing because when Granada falls in Andalusia, there are um, instances where the Christians, basically, um, yeah, in Spain, they celebrate um, this as revenge against the fall of Constantinople okay now these two instances are not linked but nonetheless there are evidences that suggest that when Constantinople was conquered that Spain the Spanish in particular got, Christians in particular got nervous at the possibility that Islam was 
was finding a way of sweeping back into Europe. And so they wanted to consolidate their power and remove the Muslims from Spain in that sense. And when Granada was, um, was defeated um, in Spain, many Muslims and Jews came to Istanbul during Bayezid's reign. Bayezid allowed them to live in Istanbul. With the Jews, there was there were some complaints that some people didn't want Jews in Istanbul. So many Jews lived in Thessaloniki, which is Salonika in Greece. But there were some Jews who, who came to Istanbul as well. And um, there's a mosque in Galata, it's called Arab Jami. Um, you should uh, go there if you get the time. It's a very fascinating mosque. And the reason there's two stories behind why it's called Arab Jami. The first one is because during the time when the, um, the Umayyads, I think it was Omar bin Abdulaziz, he signed the peace treaty with the Byzantines, because it was Omar bin Abdulaziz who, who, who brought back the Umayyad troops. Um, and it was during his reign that the Byzantines and uh, the Umayyad signed a peace treaty where the Byzantines built a mosque for them in Istanbul for merchants, Muslim merchants who would tra trade. But then after, when the Umayyads collapsed and the Abbasids also collapsed, the Byzantines took that mosque back and turned it into a church. And then the argument is, is that when uh, Bayezid becomes uh, Sultan again, that he allows Muslims from Spain, who are Arabs, to come and use that mosque again. There's a Sah Sahaba who's also buried in that mosque. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so one of the interesting things about Jem is that Jem wants to consolidate his power in um, Istanbul. As I mentioned to you before, Jem had studied philosophy. Jem was very Anatolian. Jem was um, very Eastern in his mindset, not very European like Fatih. And so Jem had a lot of um, uh, what you could say Eastern traits. And so when his son Selim was warning him, sorry, Bayezid, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, Bayezid, thank you for reminding. When Bayezid, when Selim was warning Bayezid um, that, look, um, we've got a threat, which is called the Safavid threat in the East. So the Safavids, that's Iran, and there's a threat from the Safavids in the East um, regarding um, the rise of a Shi power, um, what um, what uh, Selim was telling his father is we need to go to war with them and we need to deal with them fast because they, in those days, you got to remember, there was no borders, you understand? So there was a blurring of lines um, in that sense. Um, and so what Selim does is he basically, um, he squeezes his father and tells him that if you do not abdicate, then um, I am going to uh, remove you from power. This is the first time this has happened in Ottoman history. So in Murad's case, he abdicated himself and Fatih came to power. But in Selim's case, Selim is telling his father that if you do not abdicate, I'm going to remove you from power. And this was unthinkable. And the reason why Selim was saying this is because Selim was actually afraid or nervous of the, the Safavid threat in the East. So where you see, I know you can see the word uh, Tabris and uh, Chaldiran here. Okay, so this was the, the Safavids were there and he was nervous that more and more people from the Safavid domains were coming into the Ottoman domains um, the the ideals and the twelve ideas by the Kizilbash, who were known as particular Shias in particular, who were spreading in the Ottoman domains, and exactly there were Shia revolts in Anatolia, and so um, to some degree, uh, Selim said this needs to stop. His father refused to step down. Selim garrisoned him in in terms of the city, and then in the end, Bayezid stepped down, and Selim became in charge. And the first thing Selim did was. Um, so that was in 1510, by the way, just so you know. 1510, Selim puts pressure on his father, right? In 1514, so in, in by four years, Selim uh, musters an army. But you got to remember that getting an army together takes time. It's not like today's day and age. You know, you have to go around from area to area, province to province, convincing people to fight for you. And it took him four years to get an army. And by 14, 1514, uh, Chaldaron, um, which is here, you can see Tabris just underneath Tabris, yeah. Um, the Ottomans trounced the Safavids, absolutely trounced them. And I think I remember showing you that painting, right? Um, uh, two weeks ago, um, in that sense. And this was a absolute smashing 
of the Safavids. And what um, Selim also did is anybody who had um, any um, inclination towards um, coming from the Safavid lands or being Shia um, in certain parts of the Ottoman domains, uh, uh, Selim exiled them. He kicked them out in that sense. And then as Selim's army was returning from um, from the defeat of the Safavids, what's interesting is people always ask the question, why didn't Selim just absolutely trounce the Safavids and take over? And it's not clear why Selim didn't take over. He just stopped. Once he defeated them, he just stopped, which is intriguing because he didn't do that with the Mamluks. With the Mamluks, he pressed ahead. But with the Safavids, he didn't press ahead. Now, some, are, um, some academics have made the argument that to some degree, um, for Selim, the Mamluks ideologically were more dangerous than the Safavids. While the Safavids were a Shi power, the Mamluks uh, were using the caliphate of the Abbasids as a way of being able to delegitimize the Ottomans as a Sunni power. And so now Selim has a bit of a conundrum, a bit of a situation here. And so in 1516, Selim makes the argument that he was concerned that the Mamluks tacitly were um, supporting the Safavids by not supporting the Ottomans. And so then at uh, Marj Dabiq, 1516 near Aleppo, um, it's not on that map, but the Ottomans trounce. Selim's forces trounce the Mamluks, absolutely trounce them. And then what happens is when they defeat them at Aleppo, um, they, they, they pursue the Mamluks all the way to Damascus and Jerusalem, and they defeat the Mamluks at Damascus and Jerusalem. And then once that's done, uh, Selim and his troops, they have a conversation, which is, what do we do now? Should we kick on or should we stop? And some of Selim's advisors said, we should go back. We've do, we, this is you know, more than what we expected. We've now got Jerusalem, Damascus, um, Aleppo, and this is part of our domains. We have cornered the Mamluks into the Hijaz and into Cairo. We've defeated the, the Safavids, and the Safavids are not going to. We've exiled many of the sympathizers of the Safavids, and you know we need to head back to Istanbul. And the other side of the soldier said, you know what? We should just press ahead. We should just go all the way down to Cairo. Why not? What have we got to lose? And so Selim had to make a, a quick decision. And the decision he made is, OK, let's go to Cairo. And he went all the way down to Cairo, and he defeated the Mamluks, absolutely smashed them. And um, in some ways, now we have a situation. The situation is what? So Selim can do what, um, say, what the Mamluks did, which is to have a puppet caliphate, the caliph sitting inside, and you are the protectors of the caliph. So they took Al Mutawakkil, who was the Khalifa, and they took him to Istanbul. And they said, all right, we'll do the same. But then people started asking the question, like, Selim, but you're the one who's in power. You know, are you going to give your whole domains up to the caliph, or Al Mutawakkil? I mean, Al Mutawakkil was in charge of the Arab provinces, Cairo, Damascus, Hijaz. But are you also going to give him Anatolia and the Balkans? Is he going to be the ruler of Anatolia, the Balkans, the Hijaz, and everything? And so Salim's going, what are you talking about? This is my, this is my, this is my empire. Like, no way, no chance. So then the the problem was is that okay, if this is your empire, are we like the Mam are we like the Mongols? Did we just destroy the Khilafah? And then people went, well, no, you didn't destroy the Khilafah. You are the Khalifa. He says, okay. And why are you the Khalifa? Because you're the strongest person here. The implementation of Islam continues, and one of the conditions is the person to be strong, and you can defend the honor of Islam, you can defend the honor of the domains, and so you're the Khalifa. And so this is how the Ottomans then become the Caliphate, which is intriguing, because once the Ottomans become the Caliphate, there's two interesting ideas that come from. So, you know, um, they call, one was um, the, the Sufi Tariqats, um, they, they, they coined the term imamat i hakikat so the imam of the truth and the other one was Hilafat al-Rahmani the Khilafah of Rahma okay? and these ideas started to become very prominent in Istanbul as a way of highlighting to Selim and to people of what the Khilafah of the Ottomans ought to be okay? and in that sense um, in Istanbul, you start to see works by the ulama, and the Sufi ulama in particular, producing numerous numbers of works, 
on the idea of a Khilafah and the need for a moral ruler, a ruler who's just. And this became a, a major tenant, a foundation for Ottoman politics in regards to the Ottoman Caliphate. Whereas in the past, many members of the ulama like, like Al-Ghazali and the ba Mawardi and Baklani and so forth had written in time when the Seljuks were in power uh, as, a, as a buffer to protect the Abbasids. By the time the Ottomans come to power, it's a very different reality, a different world. And the Ottoman ulama, who never probably ex expected um, the Ottomans to become a Khilafah, have now become a Khilafah, and so they need to now educate their communities of what this means, right? So people are asking, okay, we're the Khilafah, what does that mean exactly? What, what, what is the meaning of our Khilafah? What have we done? What have we achieved? Okay, at this point, and so now you start to see a host of monumental works being produced at this moment in time in that context. Are there any questions? Um, just like um, in terms of, I guess we're looking around the world now, the Khilafah mm -hmm. has not functioned for the last th 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the Uyghur Muslims in China, the Palestinians, mm -hmm. the Syrians, the Kashmiris. I mean, especially in the time of Salim Suleiman, the early Ottoman kh kh Khilafah, mm -hmm. there was this very strong idea that when, when the Muslims would fall into trouble, the Khalifa would be there to help them out. Mm -hmm. And that was something the Ottomans did undertake, right, as a duty of theirs. So it's interesting because prior to them becoming a Khilafah, um, I don't think that they, they practiced this sort of practice. But once they became a Khilafah, I think um, the responsibility, the duty then weighed on their shoulders. They, under, they then started to realize what the institution means. And I think in some ways it's interesting. It's like, you know, um, when you're independent, even though you're Muslim, you can more or less do what you want, like in the case of India, the Safavids and the Ottomans. But once the Ottomans become a Khilafah, then it's a game changer, not only in terms of their authority, but the expectations of people around them. And and then when you're you're having the works of the ulama reminding not only them, but reminding society of what this institution means, then the Ottomans are held to account by the culture of the institution. And from that moment onwards, the Ottomans always felt a sense of of, of a need of trying to uphold the principles of what the Khilafah was. Sometimes in the earlier period, if they could um, send soldiers to fight on behalf of the Khilafah, they would do so. Um, in other parts, when they couldn't do that, they would find money and so forth. So we'll talk about this next week. But a lot of Ottom Western Ottoman historians say, but, you know, Selim didn't call himself a Khalifa. You know, you don't need to call yourself a Khalifa. Everybody knows. But in the time of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, it became complicated because the the legitimacy of the Osman, Ottoman devlet is, at, uh, is being questioned by the European powers and by the Arabs and by certain people in India. It became a necessity to then tell people, I am a caliphate. So here's the difference, right? So for example, my father's my father. He doesn't need to tell me he's my dad. He knows, you know, in that sense. But when there comes a, a question of people questioning your legitimacy, that's when these things happen. Um, and this is what happens in the case of Salim. Okay. How legitimate? So the question is, how, by Reis, how legitimate was the caliph before Selim took it? So um, what's interesting is before Selim took it, the, the Khilafah was more or less, it became nominal. Um, the authority of the Khalifa al mutawakkil was symbolic. And so what, did, what do we learn from this? We learn, as I said to you before, that the existence of the Khalifa is necessary. If you don't have one, then it leads to absolute chaos. So I guess in that sense, the idea that the Mamluks were still maintaining the office of the Khilafah is an indication of the necessity of the maintenance of a particular institution because once you destroy something, you destroy it. So they maintained it. The problem was, is that Al-Mutawakil, however, was weak. And so the, this is the difference between the Khilafah of Selim over the Khilafah of Al-Mutawakil, the Abbasids. The Abbasid one was a symbolic caliphate, but the caliphate of Selim was a caliphate based on power. So first thing we learn is that the institution must exist either way, irrespective. But the second thing we learn is that the institution for full effectiveness requires a political authority and power behind it. If you don't have power, then the, the institution is just nominal in that sense, right? So that's the, that's the answer to your question, Reis. Um, did the Sheikh al-Islam become the Grand Mufti of Makkah? No. Uh, the Sheikh al-Islam um, um, did not become the Grand Mufti of Makkah. The Makkah still had his own Grand Mufti. And that's because a lot of the times Grand Mufti were dealing with the local populace. They are dealing with the needs and interests of the locality. And uh, one of the interesting things that we have to learn in Islam 
is that the Ottoman domains was a pluralistic domains, meaning there were many different Muslims with different belonging to different madahibs, different tariqats, different positions. And in that sense, to have a Hanifi Mufti in charge of uh, Makkah at that time m may not have made sense. It happens later on, once the, slowly, slowly the Ottomans are in power and they gradually. So, for example, the, the, the main Mufti of, of Cairo, and a lot of people don't know this in Cairo, because, you know, I'll tell you something interesting. Like, I, I found it very surprising when I talk about memory. I have a lot of Egyptian friends, and when I'm pray, praying Salah with them, and we pray Salat al-Witr in Tarawih, um, they don't understand what we Hanafis are doing. They get confused when we raise our, our hands on the, on the third raka to, to, to pray. And I was surprised by this. I was like, how, how can you not know this? Like, this is standard. But it's because, to some degree, the number of Hanafis that exist in Egypt are so few and far between. And yet, in the Ottoman period, up until the collapse of the Ottomans, Cairo's Grand Mufti was Hanafi. You know, they, they had a Grand Mufti of Hanafi. You know what's interesting? In, in Egypt, they call taps Hanafiya. The reason why they call it is because the Hanafis said that you can use taps to do wudu. You know, um, it wasn't like the Shafi'is who were saying that. Even though in the Asian subcontinent, the Hanafis, they would do wudu in a, in a bowl. But uh, in the Ottoman period, the Hanafis came up with the idea of taps. Um, and running water, and the concept of can you do wudu under running water. So there was a Hanifi Mufti of, of Damascus, there was a Hanifi Mufti of Cairo, and these were prominent and powerful positions. Um, but in the early Ottoman period, the Grand Mufti in Makkah would have been somebody local. And they usually kept it local to keep the people of the locality happy. Um, no Salafis though. <laughs> Salafism didn't exist in those days. Um, okay, so Suleiman, uh, the magnificent, as they call him, al Kanuni. Okay, so um, Suleiman was alive um, after Selim, um, when Selim was alive, okay, and this is interesting because uh, as I told you, Selim was alive, uh, so, Su sorry, Suleiman was alive when Bayezid was, was, was in charge, okay, so Suleiman saw Bayezid, he saw Bayezid's uh, ruler, he saw his father challenge Bayezid, and so he had seen what his father had done, and he had supported his father. Selim is interesting because Selim was around during the time of Fatih. So Selim had seen Fatih's devlet, he had seen Bayezid's devlet, and he had his devlet. So this is a really intriguing thing in this context. And Suleiman is known as al kanuni in the Turkish and Arabic sense because he was the one who, um, who passed judgment in, in, in many ways um, in regarding particular matters. Uh, in the West, though, they see him as the Magnificent, as I mentioned before. And the reason why they see him as the Magnificent is because during his reign, the Ottoman domain was its largest, was its largest, okay? And um, Suleiman um, defeats the, the Safavids in Baghdad, unifies Baghdad, Karbala, as part of the Hijaz, he, um, and under him, um, uh, Barbarossa conquers uh, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, and they become part of the Ottoman domains. And it's in Suleiman's period um, that we see um, um, a total transformation of the Ottoman devlet. And under Suleiman, what we see is the development, one, the development of the idea of the Khilafah, two, the development of um, the Ottoman navy, um, three, the development of a distinct Ottoman architecture, and four, the development of arts, culture, and language. Okay? This happens under um, Suleiman. Um, this is Mimar Sinan. Um, he also um, streamlined the Ottoman legal structure. Yeah, so under Suleiman, it's not him that's doing it. It's the devlet. It's now it's happening. So it needed some time to um, amalgamate the Arab provinces within its domains. It then needed um, to, to make sense of this large landmass that they have. And so they need to centralize it because it's too fractured. It's, there's too much going on. So in that sense, people always say that the Turks are state builders. The Turks have a habit of building states. And um, as I told you, so Mimar Sinan is the most famous architect in Ottoman history. Well, Mimar means architect. Okay, That's what the word Mimar means. And this is the city of Edirne, the sec second capital city. And this mosque on the left is Selimiye Jami. It's the mosque built for Selim by Sinan, and the mosque, if you have another picture of this mosque um, from the outside, if you can, is it possible you can find it on the internet by any chance? It's a Selimiya Jami Edirne. 
Yav- this is not the Yavu Selim Mosque, is it? No, that's in Istanbul. So if you type in Selimiye Edirne, you will see it from the outside. And what Mimar Sinan did is he basically built a mosque on the image of, of Hagia Sophia. And he basically built it in a way where he said that I can build Hagia Sophia, but just better. I can do a better Hagia Sophia. And what's fascinating, that's this on the left. And what's fascinating about this mosque, I've been to it, it's just amazing. Is that if you stand behind one minaret, it covers the other minaret perfectly. It's a mathematical masterpiece. And um, you know the dome they say is if, if it's a, a five five millimeters in this way or that way it would collapse on itself. For anyone who's seen the dome of Hagia Sophia, it's really crooked. But when you see the dome of the Silamia Jami, uh, yeah, that's it. Do you have another side on picture of that? Um, so as you can see, look, these four minarets are perfect pencil-like minarets. The structures that is around them, yeah. Do you have a zoom out on that? You know, one time I was driving by Edirne on, on a bus and I saw that from a distance and it's, just, it's an amazing structure. It's an absolutely thon- monumental mosque. I, my personal opinion, that's the one, that picture there. Um, yeah, Which one? Uh, any one of these ones on the outside are great. Um, this one? Yeah. So you, if you can see that, and this is basically what Selim did. Selim basically said, I can build the Hagia Sophia, but just perfect it. But why did he not build it in Istanbul? The reason why he didn't build it in Istanbul is because he didn't want to embarrass Hagia Sophia as, uh, as a monumental mosque. So Istanbul has Hagia Sophia and Edirne will have the Selimiye Jami. If ever you guys get the opportunity to go to Edirne, this is the mosque. So I, my personal opinion is that this is the most monumental mosque in Turkey. It's not the Sulaymaniye, it's the Selimiye Mosque, which is... Um, and the other picture you saw was... Um, Mimar Sinan also built bridges and all sorts in in um, in, in, uh, in Edirne. This is the famous bridge in Edirne, and I, I don't know. I think Mimar Sinan was the one who built the the rainbow bridge in Mostar. So you know the the, the ones that the the Croats and the Serbs had bombed in Mostar in, in Bosnia, and Mimar Sinan had built that. And basically, Mimar Sinan had a p- policy, which was that um, whenever they built a structure, they used local workers. And they use local materials. Um, and he, he, I think he, he's the architect who's built probably the most mosque structures around the world uh, in that sense. It's phenomenal how many. How do you spell the mosque name? Okay. Okay. Um, this is uh, Abu Sud Effendi. Abu Sud Effendi was the Sheikh al Islam of. Um, during the time of uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, and he's probably one of the most famous Sheikh al-Islams in the Ottoman period. One of the interesting things about Sheikh um, uh, Ebu Sud Effendi is he um, basically started to uh, streamline some of the Hanifi fiqh law codes, and also it was Ebu Sud Effendi who passed the fatwa um, regarding Hagia Sophia. So a lot of people don't know this, but during the time of Suleiman, Muslims were building houses around Hagia Sophia, and uh, Suleiman says, what are you guys doing? And they said, you know what? Why don't we just destroy Hagia Sophia and just build a new mosque there? And uh, Ebu Sud passed the fatwa that Hagia Sophia is the monumental mosque of the Ottoman domains. So even from Fatih to Suleiman, this period, it took Muslims a bit of time to, to digest the idea that Hagia Sophia was a mosque, you know? And it was uh, Ebu Sud Effendi who, who, who put that fatwa through. You know, a lot of people don't understand this, that when monumental mosques are built in Turkey, they think that these monumental mosques were built to show how powerful the Ottomans were. That's not the case. These monumental mosques are, are what we call Juma Jami complexes. So they're Juma mosque complexes for a madrasa. And so they, like Fatih Jami and Sulaymaniye Jami, the two mosques in Istanbul, they were universities, madrasa complexes, which means that they were the Oxford and Cambridges of Istanbul. And as a result of that, those mosques at the time of Salat al-Fajr would have been filled with students. Now when you go to Istanbul, because the madrasas have become cafes and so forth because of the secular Turkish Republic, people just see the big mosque. So they think that the Ottomans were just building big mosques. But if you see, they didn't build many big mosques. Whenever you see a big mosque, it was part of a madrasa complex. It was part of a complex in which thousands of madrasa, Ulumuddin students would go to pray. 
in that sense. Yes, and there were markets, soup kitchens, and so forth, which were upkeeping and taking care of the mosque in that sense. Okay, do you want to go to the next slide? So, as I said, um, the Ottomans um, and the Suleiman become powerful in regards to the seat. Now, to be fair, um, this map could be a little bit of a stretch. Um, but that doesn't mean that the Ottomans were not um, powerful because in your next slide, you go to your next slide. Um, that's the gunpowder, the one after that, sorry. Where, where happened to Barbarossa? We lost oh, There he is. Uh, the pirate turned commander Barbarossa. Now, actually, I want to make this clear. He wasn't a pirate, okay? The, pi the word pirate is the word that Europeans use to 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 make us negative all right in that sense what so what barbarossa did is whenever there was christian uh, ships that were going through the territories of the ottoman domains the muslims would stop them it's just like you know the caravans when Rasulullah bin badr was stopping reducing uh, more um sufyan's caravans they're doing exactly the same and the thing is is because the westerners didn't know you know how to coin the Muslims they call them pirates in a pejorative sense and actually what's interesting is if you watch Pirates of the Caribbean all those characters are Muslim all of them Jack Sparrow from what I remember let me just remember Jack Sparrow's name Jack Sparrow Muslim his name from what I remember was um, I have it here okay uh, his name was. Where did it go? Uh, where is it? Uh, he converted to Islam and says, so "Say Jack Ward." His real name was Jack Ward. Converted to Islam and and lived under the an Algerian governor. Okay, and his name I think was Abdul Rahman Al Asur. Um, was what his name became. Okay, um, because he had a bird with him, and so. What you start to see, Asfur, yeah, that's right. His name was Jack Asfur, okay, Abdurrahman Asfur. And what's intriguing is Barbarossa in the Pirates of the Caribbean was known as Redbeard. And yes, he wasn't a trunk then, you know. So what you see is Barbarossa, maybe it comes from the word Baba Aruch, which means the father of fasting, the one who fasts. And um, they, um, they basically had uh, defeated the non-muslims in the, in that stretch and um, now in narratives and stories they've made us to be drunkards and so forth and pirates and they they create so i want you to understand this when you see things like uh, pirates and barbarians and these sort of saracens these sort of terms that are used in a no negative sense to categorize muslims in many ways you know and this is very common in in western language in that sense but actually um in the ottoman context uh, so Barbarossa is um, he's, he's buried in Istanbul in Besiktas, and uh, yeah, he has a is a wonderful, wonderful grave. So if ever you guys come to it, I'll show you. It's, it's an amazing uh, tomb complex, and the road is called uh, Barbarossa, and then the next road next to it is called Al Jazair. And Barbarossa was very famous in in Algeria. Okay, so one of the reasons why the Ottomans were powerful in terms of the sea. Is because they had cannons. They were known as the gunpowder um, uh, dynasty, and their use of cannons was exceptional. So what we see is the Ottomans and Europe. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I mean, just very quickly, we'll start a yeah, couple sure. of minutes. Yeah. The, 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 in Suleiman's time, we have this big war with the Portuguese yeah. because they're, they're destroying the market towns of the Muslims in India. They're causing yeah. a lot of problems for the Muslims in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. So Suleiman now, in defense of his realm as the Khalifa, yeah. That's where Barbarossa becomes famous. And is it Piri Reis? I mean, his successor yeah. who takes over after him, there's a big mm -hmm. campaign of yeah. naval supremacy that the Ottomans do. I mean, is there maybe a couple of words on that, inshallah? Before yeah, so on. one of the interesting things, as you said, is right, is that not only are the Ottomans... So one of the problems the Portuguese are happening, having is that the Ottomans are like basically controlling major areas and, 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 and so routes of traveling for the Portuguese in particular. And also, as you correctly pointed out, Muslims around the world now are turning to the Ottomans for help and assistance. And the Ottomans recognize that. So the Ottomans, in their capacity, have uh, continuously um, expanded into areas. And Barbarossa, in particular, was phenomenal. The legend, he's a, in that sense, the legend of Barbarossa, that he was like totally trancing um, 
the, the Spanish and the Portuguese dynasties in terms of their, their, their movement was a huge problem because what it forced the European powers to do is go the long way around to India. You know, um, if you see the map, I mean, like they, they had to literally like imagine if you're, you're Spain, you can see there. Now, how do you get to India without not going into Ottoman territory? You have to go all the way around the bottom of Africa. Right. And that's a problem in that context, in, in, in that sense. So there was a lot of problems that they had. Um, but unfortunately for the Ottomans, by and large, it was the siege of Vienna, where the Ottomans um, had, had, had failed in, in, in defeating the Viennese in 1529. And as a result, you know, um, the Ottomans couldn't continue their extension. But it, it's, the other interesting thing you have to understand, it became very hard for the Ottomans. Huh? This is, look how large the landmass is. It's a humongous landmass to, to try to then take over and regulate. And so the Ottomans, after this point, they become occupied by internal matters and unable to support the external matters in that sense. Um, oh, you want to talk about girl power? I haven't heard of Spice Girl since a long time. So this is Hurrum Sultan. Hurrum Sultan was the wife of Suleiman the Magnificent. One of the interesting things is, when you read the biography of, of this period, we learn that Hurrum wasn't necessarily pretty. But somehow um, Suleiman was besotted by her. You know, he had some sort of like, you know, and usually um, uh, the policy was to have one son from one woman. Um, and the reason being is because you didn't want your sons to fight each other. Right. So when the Ottoman sultans usually were fighting each other, the sons, it's because they were sons from different wives. OK. And in this case, um, Hurrem had four sons with Suleiman, which was bizarre. Like Suleiman went against tradition. And didn't listen to people. He had four sons with her, and he had one son whose name was um, Mustafa, uh, and uh, Mustafa was the son of another woman called Mahi Devran. And Mustafa, it was assumed, was supposed to be in charge of uh, of of the domains after Suleiman would die. He was the oldest son, the most competent son, and so forth. But Hurrem uh, created a particular culture and power in which he made Suleiman believe that Mustafa is going to lay siege on Suleiman the way Selim laid siege on Bayezid. And Suleiman believed it. And as a result, Suleiman had Mustafa executed. And not only did Suleiman have Selim, um, uh, Mustafa executed, but Ibrahim Pasha, who was his best friend, the Grand Vizier, and the supporter of Suleiman, his name was Ibrahim Ibrahim Pasha Makbul. Okay, when he was killed, he became Ibrahim Pasha Maktul. And for those of you who, who know the difference between Makbul and Maktul, it's interesting when you write in Arabic, like you know, it's just changing, just the changing of the dots. But it's from the one who's venerated to the one who became unfortunate, right? And so what's intriguing is when you go to um, the tomb of Suleiman the Magnificent, you will see that Hunam. The wife of the Sultan is usually buried with the Sultan, but she's buried separately. And there is an indication that she, because she died after, um, is Maktul, no? Maktul means to be murdered? The one yeah, who was he killed? was murdered. He was executed. Okay, sorry, I thought you, they said unlucky or something. Sorry, my no, bad. He was e executed. Sorry, yeah, it was my mistake. Okay. And um, so um, what? she's buried separately from, from Suleiman. And some people believe she's buried separately because after she died, you know, some of the advisors just really didn't like her and didn't want her to bury her next to her husband. And they buried her, you know, um, on the other side. But for a woman um, in the Ottoman domains, um, she became very powerful and she has been critiqued uh, as being one of the women that created uh, um, uh, sent forms of chaos within the Ottoman state. Um, some Ottoman writers then made the case that if women ever come close to power and proximity, this is they used her as an example and saying that this is what happens, beware of her and so forth. Um, but I think she's still an exception in, in some ways um, because we don't hear about the wives after that. Okay. Um, when Suleiman dies, he's a, he dies a very old and broken man. Oh, yeah, this is interesting, you know. Um, so you, the size of the turban is an indication of your power and authority. And um, the bigger the turban, the more powerful you are in, in that sense, okay? And so Suleiman's turban is huge. Uh, actually, the biggest turban I saw was Fatih's turban. 
So when you go to the tombs of the Ottoman sultans, they'll put their turbans on their tombs. Now these, I have to stress that these were not turbans they wore, these were just ceremonial turbans, probably only worn, you know, like when the, you know, like when the queen is, is, is doing something important and inauguration and she has to wear her crown. So, but we, we're not people that wore crowns in that sense. So what's the picture on the left? This picture is an imagination or a legend that when Suleiman was at his pomp, that the Europeans had provided him with this headgear as a, a reflection of his absolute might and power. I haven't seen this in real life to believe whether this is reality or legend, but it's intriguing how the non-Muslims imagine Suleiman and how, yeah, exactly on both occasions. I mean, he's got solid neck muscles. So it's interesting on the left, he's like, you can actually see the neck muscles, but on the right, and he's got such a slender neck, but even wearing such a humongous turban with a neck like that, it's just not possible um, in that sense. Okay, so, so the, the, we're going to tell him a second in terms of defeating Lepanto, but actually the main, some people argue the main issue was Suleiman's um, problems at Vienna in 1521, the siege in Vienna, was the, the beginning of a certain problematic areas in regards to Europe. After Suleiman dies, we have the contestation between his two sons, Selim and Bayezid. Selim II wins over, and um, Selim's period is a period of, of some level of, of challenging contestation. And now what they need to do after Selim's period is, is a period of consolidation. The, uh, the devil, the domains are so large that the uh, Ottomans need to consolidate their authority. But unfortunately for them, um, you know, it's, it's um, while you're trying to consolidate your authority, it doesn't mean that other powers are still not going to try to encroach on your interests. And in that sense, the, in, this was a defeat by the Ottomans in that sense. And so we, we have a bit of a situation. I wouldn't say this is a start of decline in the Ottomans, but the world is changing very quickly uh, in that sense. Yes, yeah, Suleiman, yeah, he's, he's his son. Um, okay, so um, we have, let me just go to the end. We're going to do some some time skips. So now in uh, 1595, we have Sultan Ahmed. And Sultan Ahmed is a very young Sultan who comes to power at 19 years old. And at 19 years old, um, he dies at the age of 27. So he was unable to go on the guzzle. As a result of that, unable to go on the guzzle. And what, so Mehmed III and Sultan Ahmed II, I mean, what's happening in their period basically is firstly, the fratricide is going crazy. Um, because Suleiman set a precedent where a man can have more than one son from one woman. And, and the second thing is, is that um, uh, basically um, the Ottoman domains needs to consolidate its authority. Uh, so where we see rapid expansion in Salim and Suleiman, the domains can't handle it. It's happened too fast, too excessively. And so to attain authority and governmental authority, they need... The, they actually needed Mehmed and Ahmed to slow things down, actually. Now, Muslims see that as a period of decline because they're not seeing expansion, but the expansion is impossible. Like, you, you, it's just not. Um, but Sultan Ahmed was unable to, to go on the Ghazal because he was young. Uh, but what he did is he built this mosque, the Sultan Ahmed Mosque, um, um, to be remembered by in that sense. And when he built this mosque, it was very controversial. Now, as you can see, this mosque had six minarets, right? And it's built opposite Hagia Sophia. When it was built, a lot of people complained that this was not necessary. But nonetheless, Sultan Ahmed had it built and he died at the age of 27. And when he dies, um, there is a situation. You have his son, Osman, who's 14 years old, or you have Mustafa, um, his brother. And so what happens is, um, um, because Osman is the only son and he's young, we have a, a situation which is, what do we do in terms of authority? Do we put a young Osman in charge, who's 14? Or do we put my brother in charge, who's Mustafa, who, who's, who, who, who should be in charge? And so um, in, initially, um, there's a contestation. The ulama are back in Mustafa uh, in many ways because the ulama saw this as an opportunity in which they can consolidate and reconstruct the, the Bayah culture in which the Bayah can be given to anyone in the house of Osman. It doesn't have to be the son. And because they moved away from the fratricide, they're no longer going to do fratricide where they're killing each other. But instead, we can choose someone. So they went for Mustafa. But an internal palace coup, um, facilitated by the chief eunuch and grand vizier, 
men that Genj Osman, Osman the, the, the it means Genj means young. Genj Osman came into power. And so when Osman is in power, he's 14 years old and he needs to prove to himself and to everyone that he's a justifiable sultan. He gets married at 14, um, you know, and has uh, children. And in 1621, he goes to war in Poland, but he's not successful. And in 1622, he wants to go on the Hajj. And this is a problem. He wants to take his troops and he wants to go down to on the Hajj and people warned him that going on the Hajj is problematic. The ulama were concerned that if you leave Istanbul and you go on the Hajj, you're going to create a, a vacuum-like situation in Istanbul. But that wasn't the only problem. The other problem was is that he wanted to create a new army and that new army had agitated the Janissaries. So the Janissaries, they, they, they do a like a revolt and they support Mustafa. And they want Mustafa to come into power and they execute Osman and the regicide. It's the first time that a Sultan has been killed in that sense. And he was killed by the Janissary Corps and Mustafa was put into power. And we see a totally different change in the Ottoman domains. And Baki Tezjan is a famous Ottoman historian. He calls this the second empire, meaning that a change and shift are taking place in the Ottoman culture where the Janissaries were now choosing which Ottoman Sultan. So before the Ottoman Sultans would race to Istanbul, Genç Osman was the first sultan to be born in Istanbul and the Janissaries would choose and decide who should be in power. And now we see a humongous shift. That's a lot of information for today. I apologize for that. But we're trying to... Yeah. Are there any questions? He's known as Mustafa the Mad, that is true. But, but some people do contest that, that he wasn't actually mad or something. Yeah, yeah sometimes so what happens is people would be called or claimed to be mad just so that they could be, be de de delegitimized. Salih Yusuf, you have your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? Does anybody want to come in? We don't have long because we'll start that needs to go very soon. So if people have questions, please do, inshallah. I mean, what we could do is, next session, obviously, we're going to try and finish the whole from 1620 till the fall. So that's, um, that is a 300-year period, and that's yeah. going to be interesting, inshallah. We'll try our best. There's going to be a lot of skipping, I think, for next week. Yeah, yeah. we're going to do a lot of time skips. But um, we might even try and just book a short one hour session after that just to Q&A, like whatever yeah, questions yeah, you guys yeah. accumulated throughout the sessions. But if anybody has any questions now, please do ask away. Um, you only got a couple of minutes though, so short and sharp if possible. What was the battle called again? Which battle? There were so many. The Selim II, Lepanto, the Battle of Lepanto. Oh yeah, Lepanto.